You finally built your deck after drafting three packs, crafting a cohesive and powerful combination of creatures and non-creature spells that will hopefully help you take down your pod during Friday Night Magic. But no magic player can exist on spells alone. You're going to need to add lands to make a playable deck. But how many and what should you choose? This is the question we're looking to answer in today's Talarian Tutor. When constructing your deck from either a sealed pool or a draft, there are many different elements you'll need to balance to become victorious. We'll cover all of these in today's lesson, including balancing multiple colors in a deck, good mana sources, how our mana curve affects our mana sources, what to do when splashing a color, and re-examining the color ratio theory we introduced in our mana curve and land base lesson. We're not beginners anymore, but we're not yet at the Pro Tour. This is for people who already play at Friday Night Magic, who want to improve and get better. This is for the intermediaries, and this is Talarian Tutor. First, we need to talk about balance. Building a deck is like putting together a recipe for cooking, part inspiration and part science. You'll need to compare and evaluate different ingredients like spices, sugar, and salt, a lot of salt, in order to create a delicious dish. In magic, you'll be balancing spells and lands when making your deck to create a cohesive, game-winning whole. This is particularly crucial in a limited environment where you'll usually be playing a 40-card deck. With fewer cards, every card you draw will be crucial in making sure your strategy comes through. Though most limited decks run 15 to 18 lands, we'll be going over some of the broader elements you'll need to keep in mind before focusing on specific recommendations. The different elements we'll need to balance when considering our mana base are spells, mana curve, colors, how many are we playing, where are they on our mana curve. These parts need to come together harmoniously in your game plan. As we've been reiterating time and again, you always need to know what your deck is trying to do and how it's going to win to be an effective magic player. No matter how many colors you're playing in a limited deck, you always want to have at least six mana sources for each color, with at least eight mana sources for your primary color. When we're talking about mana sources, we're not just referring to basic lands. We're also including lands that can tap for multiple colors like Canyon Slough, Sun Petal Grove, and Shimmering Grotto, lands that can be sacrificed to fetch other lands like Evolving Wilds or Terramorphic Expanse, artifacts that can be sacrificed or tapped for colors, like Manolith or Traveler's Amulet, and creatures that either produce colored mana or fetch it, like Llanowar Elves or Jungle Wayfinder. When building your deck, it's important to keep these in mind as you ponder your mana base. After all, it would be really silly to bring in more forests if you have several Llanowar Elves, or an extra mountain for your splash if you've already got one and a Manolith. So what about that mana curve? As we've said before, laying out the curve of your deck, that is, sorting your spells by mana cost, is a great way to understand what your strategy is and what you'll be hoping to play each turn. Ideally, you'll want to play a two-costed spell on turn two, a three-costed spell on turn three, and so on. However, this assumes you can pay at least that amount of mana for those turns, which means you'll need to consistently draw those mana sources every time. When you curve out your spells, take note of how much those spells cost and how many there are. Most limited decks aim to have about 15 creatures and 8 non-creature spells for a total of 23. This leaves room for 17 lands for a ratio of 23 to 17, spells to lands. However, your game plan and strategy may shift this ratio slightly. For example, are you an aggro or tempo deck that has low-costed spells and creatures? If your mana curve is highest around the 1 to 2 mana slots and your highest-costed spell is 4 mana, mana, then you'll most likely be playing fewer lands, perhaps 15 or 16. After all, if you only need three lands to play 90% of your deck, then you won't need to draw as many in order to keep your game plan going. This allows you to play 24 or 25 spells. Keep in mind that while you don't need many lands to get your creatures and spells going, you'll still want to draw them reliably and maybe cast several spells a turn. 
On the other hand, you might be playing a more mid-range or controlled deck that's mana hungry and needs to be able to not only cast increasingly larger spells on every turn, but perhaps also keep mana up to respond to your opponent. In these cases, you're often playing larger creatures and spells as the game progresses, finishing with a large bomb like Chromium or transforming Nicol Bolas, the Ravenger, into his Planeswalker form. In these cases, you'll definitely want to run around 17 lands or 18 mana sources, which is almost half your deck. While this might seem like a lot of lands, it's vital that you keep drawing the mana you need in order to cast your spells, because while spells and creatures can be powerful and game-ending, they do nothing if you can't cast them. Let's talk colors, and the first question to ask is, how many colors are you playing? It goes without saying that for most monocolored decks, you'll usually only need that one color of land. However, most decks in Limited play two colors, since draft formats nowadays are usually designed around two color archetypes. But playing two colors doesn't necessarily mean splitting your lands evenly. In the past, we've referred to the ratio exercise in our mana curve and land-based video as a useful tip you can use when building out your deck. To review, by counting up the different mana symbols and seeing what the ratio is of one to another, you can have a general idea of how to divide your land count accordingly. For example, let's say you've drafted a green-white deck that has 28 mana symbols, 14 of which are white and 14 of which are green. You have 17 slots for lands and have a sun petal grove, so it would make sense at first glance to split your remaining 16 lands into 8 plains and 8 forests. This division does abide by our at least six mana sources for each color and having eight sources for our primary color, Golden Rule. However, this isn't always necessarily the case depending on your mana curve. We'll put a pin in that for now and get back to it later in the lesson. Three or more colors. When playing more than two colors, we'll need to consider just how committed we are to playing that third, fourth, or even fifth color. We'll cover splashing colors in just a bit, but for the purposes of this segment, we'll take a look at decks that are firmly three or more colors. The difference between splashing a color and actually having that color be a firm part of that deck's identity comes down to the number of spells you have that require that color as part of its casting cost. If you have more than two spells that require a single red, for example, or a card that needs two red sources in its casting cost, it's fair to say that you're no longer just splashing red. You'll definitely need at least six red mana sources in your deck to cast those spells consistently. Let's take, for example, a limited 40-card deck that is white, green, and black. It has 17 lands and needs to accommodate eight sources for white, its primary color, and six sources for both green and black. Here's one way it might be accomplished. For white, the primary color, six planes, one sun petal grove, one isolated chapel. For green, it's secondary, four forests, one sun petal grove, one Llanowar elf, which can produce green. For black, also the secondary, at five swamps, one isolated chapel. So the total composition of lands for this deck would be six plains, five swamps, four forests, one isolated chapel, and one sun petal grove. This makes 17 lands total. Of course, this may shift depending on where the colors are arranged in the deck's mana curve. However, understanding how to count and adjust for good mana sources is essential in maintaining consistency in drawing your mana and playing out your deck. As we've mentioned before, splashing a color means that you're playing one or two cards in your deck that only have one mana symbol of that color. For example, let's say you're playing a black-white life gain deck in M19 and you're splashing red for Banefire. Banefire only has one red mana symbol in its casting cost, so it's an easy card to splash for. However, let's say you wanted to play Sarkon the Fireblood as well. Since Sarkon has two red mana symbols in its casting cost, he would not be considered a splashable card. Now, when we splash for a card, we have to consider what we're giving up when we decide to include that card in our deck. Deck. Every decision in Magic has its trade-offs and risks, and splashing a color is no different. A good question to ask yourself when considering a splash card is, what does this card do for me? The utility of this card needs to be weighted against disrupting the consistency of your mana. Is it worth being mana screwed on occasion if the benefits are just that high? 
Let's take Banefire again as an example. It's a sorcery that costs X and one red and reads, Banefire does X damage to any target. If X is five or more, this spell cannot be countered and the damage cannot be prevented. If all we need is one red to cast this spell and it's late enough in the game such that we've built up a lot of mana, we could absolutely one-shot our opponent for 12 or even 13 damage. Even in the early stages of the game, Banefire could be used to get rid of a bomb and achieve board parity. So, for a card that is both versatile and high impact like Banefire, it's easy enough to decide whether or not it's worth including in your deck. If you're splashing just for those one or two cards, having two to three mana sources for those colors should usually be enough. However, in a monocolor deck, you can probably get away with adding four or so more mana sources of the splash color. For example, a mono blue deck that plays Luminous Bonds could easily add four planes and be perfectly fine. Generally speaking, if you want to splash more than just one color, you may just want to rethink your build as a whole and consider the three or more colors section we covered before. At this point, you'll be severely compromising the consistency of your deck, so be sure you have adequate fixing before you venture down that thorny path. Sometimes, when Saturn is in retrograde and the sun rises in the west, Magic releases a limited format where playing all five colors is not only acceptable, but expected. An example of this was the Shards of Alara format, where you were often playing five colors and absolutely needed all of them to cast large spells. In those incredibly rare situations, you'll hopefully have some fixing. But remember, you'll want at least six good sources of mana for each color for cards that have a high density of those particular colors, or have a double pip of those colors. You'll also want eight mana sources for your primary if you have one. In these cases, you're most likely playing 19 to 20 mana sources. While this is, yes, half your deck, you absolutely need that many mana sources to draw all five colors consistently for almost every game. Keep in mind that golden rule, you need at least six good mana sources for each color. Even with fixing, that's a tall order for any limited deck to meet. So where are our colors on the mana curve? While counting up your mana symbols and creating a ratio of them is useful in determining a baseline for your mana base, it shouldn't always be the final say. This is where we start looking at not just how many colors you have, but also where they are in your mana curve. Let's say you have a green-white deck and you have a Sun Petal Grove as your fixing. Almost all of your one and two costed spells need at least one green source to cast, where your larger spells at three and four mana need white. Sure, your Resplendent Angel and a Johnny both need double white in order to be played, but given how heavily your early turns rely on casting green spells, the odds are that you'll want to make sure you draw green consistently. After all, you don't want to get stuck on mana and die to a low-costed aggro deck by turn four. So in this case, we'll want to skew slightly towards green, just to be sure we hit those early drops. Therefore, we'll want to play nine forests, seven plains, and that one sun petal grove. Always keep in mind which colors you want to play and when in the duration of that game. If you can't hit your early drops, you might not get to play a real game of magic. Thanks again for watching another session of Talarian Tutor. Today we covered limited mana bases and its many nuances, including balancing lands and spells, how our game plan and mana curve affects our mana base, building mana bases for multiple colors, when and how to splash for a color. This is Talarian Community College. I'm the professor. Our professional consultant is my own tutor, Emma Handy. Michelle Rapp is our script supervisor. And remember, it's not about winning individual games of magic. It's about getting better, win or lose.